Well, we are facing a lot of challenges now. I don't know how many of you knew this, but there is a pandemic going on. And so we had half of our praise team at home sick this morning. So guys, take care of yourselves. And uh, I just want to ask personally, I know that, that there's a real strong demand that I stand at the back door and everybody wants to give me a hug on the way out the door. And I'm just saying, stop, self-control people. So I don't think we can, uh, we can hug. I think you, the Bible says, greet the brethren with the holy kiss. I don't want to do that either. <laughs> so uh, anyway, we're just so thankful that uh, so far, a number of our church family have, have, uh, have been sick, but thankfully God's brought them through. And uh, God is faithful. Even though there are many times I failed him, not as many times as you fail him, but there are times that... <laughs> <laughs> I have failed him a lot of times, but I'm thankful the God I serve has never failed me yet. Amen. Can I get a, a good amen on that? <laughs> well, you know, we're living in, we're living in some, some crazy times. And, um, you know, I was thinking about this the other day. I, you know, for a few years, a number of decades, things actually for us, and I'm talking about the, the human race, have, have been going pretty well. Uh, I came across this recently, and it added a little perspective to what we're going through now. If you Imagine if you were born in the year 1900. Now, I was born in 1905, so I can relate to this. My first pet was a dinosaur, amen? But imagine if you were born in the year 1900, and all the things that you would have experienced in your lifetime. So, in 1914, you're 14 years old, World War I begins and ends when you're 18 years old, and 22 million people have died in World War I. One. In 1920, you're 20 years old, and there's a global pandemic. That sounds a little familiar, doesn't it? The Spanish flu appears, and, and it raged for two years, and by the end of the Spanish flu pandemic, there's 50 million people worldwide that had died. But this has happened at the time you're 20 years of age. When you're 29, 1929, you survive the global economic crisis that started with the collapse of the New York Stock Exchange, causing inflation unemployment, and famine. So as you're moving into your wonderful 30s, when you're 33 years old, the Nazis come to power. And in 1939, you're 39, and World War II begins and ends when you're 45 years old, and 60 million people have died, including 5 million Jews, or 6 million Jews, rather, that were extinguished in the Holocaust. 1952, you're 52 years old, and the Korean War starts. 1964, you're 64, and the Vietnam War starts and ends when you're 75. So there was a lot. <laughs> you're born in 1900. You saw a lot of things happening. And so I know over the few decades, we should always be thankful for those seasons when it's like God gives us a rest from, from all the things that are happening. But a lot of times we can ask, why me? Sometimes we just need to ask, why not me? Because God's grace is going to be sufficient in every situation that we encounter. We're doing a new series, starting a new series today called The Lord is My Shepherd. Most of us can identify with, with certain characters in Scripture. I, I just, uh, I've, on several occasions, I love to read about the life of David. David was one of those incredible guys. I, 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 I read this once, I think it's about 78 times that David is mentioned in Scripture, Old Testament, New Testament. He's just all over the book. In fact, Jesus is referred to as the, as the son of David. David was, David was a man after God's own heart. Two things we know about David. Number one, he was a warrior, pretty much undefeated in battle. You did not go against David. You, if that was a surefire way to lose is to engage in battle with David. The second thing is you couldn't trust him around your wife. That's what we also <laughs> know about David. So David was, not, David was not perfect, but he was a man after God's own heart. It's not hard to see why he was a man after God's own heart when you begin to read some of the Psalms. And one of our favorites, I think, for the, for the Christian family, one of our favorites is Psalms 23. Because when you, when you read the Psalms, you, I, I can just relate to the heartache. I can relate to the despair. I can relate to the fear. I can relate to the brokenness. I can relate to all those to all those things. Yeah, you know, I see these guys on I see these guys on TV. These young, good-looking guys that have hair, and they have these massive churches, and they've just lived a blessed life. I can't relate to any of that stuff. Just show me where the broken people are. Just show me where the damaged people are. That's where that's where 
I need to be. And I'm thankful that we're not a perfect church, but we've chosen and we've decided we're going to walk in love. And we're just held, held together by His grace. I'm so thankful this morning for His grace and His mercy. So we're going to go through over the next six weeks, we're going to go through the, 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 this 23rd Psalm, The Lord is My Shepherd. I was, we were trying to, I was trying to figure out well, what could be a title for this. And uh, so JJ, he kind of runs our multimedia thing. He said, well, why don't we call it the Lord is our shepherd? Okay, just be quiet and handle the computer. We'll do that. <laughs> so, no, great, great suggestion. The Lord is my shepherd. Although that, that really is a good title, but I think there's another theme that's very prominent in Psalms 23, and that is the goodness of God. Man, I'm thankful for his goodness. Man, I'm thankful for his blessings. I'm thankful for his favor, his goodness in my life when I do not deserve it. So the term shepherd is, is, is an interesting term, and, and Psalms 23, 1 does say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That's the ESV version. And when we think of shepherds, we automatically think of, of persons or people that are tending sheep, but there's really more than one application to the term shepherd. Now, do I have any real Texans here? Okay, so if you're a real Texan, you can either reach into your wallet or your purse and pull your gun out and show it to me. So, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Don't do that. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> so in, 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 in Texans, we're not much about sheep, but we, you know, all, most of us have in our backyard, we have cattle and horses. How many of you have cattle and horses in your backyard? It's funny because, some, you know, he, he really does. Yeah, he's got chickens and all kinds of things. So uh, during Armageddon, we're going to go to Tommy's house because he's, he's the only doomsday prepper in the church. So we're headed to his church out on his, but you might let him know because he, he can shoot pretty straight. They, they, they call him Dead-Eye dead eye Tom. No, that's not, that's not what they call him. But there are, uh, the, the term shepherd, there's actually several applications, and, and the word shepherd is found 12 times in the New Testament. And almost every time that that Greek word, that original Greek word that is, is used for shepherd is found, it's, it's rendered shepherd, but, but in one, and it really depends on the translation, but there's several translations that one or two places, they will render that, that uh, translation as the word pastor. So the term shepherd and pastor are synonymous in the New Testament. So I thought, you know, when I first became pastor, uh, some of us would go out to eat, and, and one time we went to a Mexican food restaurant, because in Aransas Pass, here are your options. You have either a Mexican food restaurant, or a Mexican food restaurant, or another Mexican food restaurant, or a Mexican food restaurant. Thank, thankfully, Mark and Barbara opened up Butter Turn. They gave us a break from the Mexican food so we So we obviously went to a Mexican food restaurant. And so we were talking about what we were going, we were going to get, and I thought, well, here's the, here's the plate I should probably get since I was the pastor of the church. I was going to get the El Pastor plate, the El Pastor tacos. And I thought, there's got to be some really deep theological association if they have El Pastor. I thought, that's what I should probably get. And then I got to looking, and El Pastor is pork. It's pig. So it's like a plate dedicated to fat pastors. I don't know. El Pastor, El Gordo, you know, I, I, I actually didn't get that, but I thought, I thought that was interesting. But, okay, so I, I, when I was looking at this, uh, El Pastor really means in the Spanish language, and, and it, it refers to how that the meal is prepared. It, it means shepherd style. It's a shepherd style type of dish. So even in Espanol, El Pastor would refer to a shepherd. So it's, it's really interesting concept, the shepherd. And the, thankfully that the Lord is our shepherd. Now, uh, we've got some folks here. How many of you have ever literally killed the food you were going to eat? We've got some hunters here today. Oh, wow. It's, we got some real Texans here. Now, I like to eat whatever it is. I like to eat the fatted calf after H-E-B or Walmart's got a hold of it first. It seems like it's a lot easier, and preferably somebody else has cooked it. But, I mean, I'll fire up the grill if I, if I, if I need to. So uh, most of us don't really go out and kill our food unless you're a hunter. Then you go out and you do it for sport. But then also you fill your freezer full of all kinds of, uh, all kinds of good stuff. So we don't really, but we don't relate that much to sheep. And the whole concept of shepherd is something that's very foreign to us. 
Yeah, I mean, I was raised in San Antonio, so I'm, a, I'm sort of a city slicker. There is a, man, there's a lot of cowboys there, just as there are all over the state of Texas. A lot of cowboys, a lot of hunters, a lot of ranchers, people that have horse, horses and all that kind of stuff. So we're much more familiar with horses. I mean, come, really, okay, so we wouldn't be surprised if somebody actually rode a horse to church. I mean, it's Texas. You know, just ride a horse. But if you tried to ride a sheep to church, guys, we're definitely taking your man card. You can't, no. I mean, we don't, re we don't relate to the whole shepherding sheep thing. It's a concept that, that's a little foreign. And sometimes, you know, in Scripture, we really have to put ourselves in the place of the writer. We have to understand the culture a little bit to really get the depth of meaning in God's Word. And so, uh, yeah, I, basically, if I want to know anything I want to know about shepherding, I'll read a book about it. I don't really need to go out and chase sheep around. So it's interesting because the term shepherd and pastoring is synonymous in Scripture. And I have people sometimes ask me, what is it like, what is it like to be a pastor? What is it really like? Well, I've got an instructional video they show you at seminary. This is exactly what it's like to be a pastor. Can we, <laughs> how many of you want to sign up for Bible college now? <laughs> But David writes, I'm, th I'm thankful, I'm thankful that the Lord is our shepherd, and I'm thankful we don't have any sheep like that here in our, in our church. Well, not too many. Um, but David writes, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You know, we used to sing this song years ago in church, old school, old school chorus. Some of you have ever remember that, that song, He's All I Need? He's all I need. Sing it with me. He's all I need, Jesus is all I need. How many remember it? Do you remember that? He's all I need, He's all I need, Jesus is all I need. So I remember we would sing that chorus growing up, but what I, what I found is that you don't really know he's all you need until he's all you have. Because there are times in our lives when we suffer tremendous adversity. And there are times in our lives, some of you, it's my prayer that your life, that you're in a prosperous place in your life, that your job is doing well, that your finances are such and your health is good and all those types of things. But that's my prayer that that's where you are at in your life today. But there are other times that we go through adversity, we go through challenges, we go through shortages. Our, the stack of bills is higher than our paycheck and we're struggling trying to figure out how. But you know what? He is all that we need. And I believe that's what David was saying. He is all I need. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Throughout many of the Psalms that David wrote, he was, he was on the run for 10 years of his life after he was anointed king, after he sat in the palace, in the king's palace, and he played his harp. And the Bible says as David played his harp and he sang, and the spirit of the Lord was already in his life, and that evil spirit that was upon Saul would depart from him. And David already had a taste of what it was like to be in the palace. But then that spirit that was on Saul turned and then Saul sent out assassins in the land to destroy, try to destroy David because he perceived him as a threat. And many times Saul was delivered to the hands of David, but David said, I'm not going to take his life because I'm not going to touch. He was once God's anointed. And so David realized and came to the point, and you read this throughout the Psalms, no matter the heartache, no matter the, the, the struggles and the problems that he was going through, he realized that the Lord was all that he needed. And when he's in our life, He's really all that we really need. And that's the beautiful thing about it. Sometimes when we're going through adversity, we're going through difficult times. Sometimes in your hardest, the hardest parts of your life is when you gain real perspective. Because, you know, as we, as we kind of go into, uh, we've gone into this pandemic and, and all of us know somebody we've lost to this illness. And as as we lose people that we know, and, and sometimes even loved ones, and friends and neighbors, uh, thankfully nobody in our church has, has passed away from it. But you know, when, when you experience things like that, it really changes your priorities. And so there are things that are, have been important in your life in the past. They're not important to you anymore because you know that the things that are important are your health, 
The things that are important are the people that God placed in your life. And listen, listen, guys, you have to understand that the people that are in our lives are only here for a short period of time. And we say that's my wife. We say that's my kids. We say that's my parents. They are not yours. They don't belong to you. They belong to him. And he can take them home at any time. Now, we don't all have a promise that we're all going to live to be 100 and then the rapture takes place and we, we all go at the same time. But I'll tell you one thing. I know that when my number is called, when he calls my name, I know that I'm ready because I've made the decision that I'm not going to face life without Christ and I'm sure not going to face death without him because that's my hope today. We don't sorrow as others which have no hope. We have the hope of the resurrec resurrection. We have a hope that this life is not the end. And to the point that we suffer in this life, we're going to rejoice and be rewarded in the next life because you have to go to the cross before you get the crown. Can you get amen? Amen. Say amen if you want. I prefer you take an offering. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. So David realized, David realized that the Lord was going to take care of him. He was not going to lack anything that he needed. Sometimes it's good for us to remember, guys, who's in control and who our source is. And we need to learn to trust him more. I can tell you there's a real, there's a real simple test. You can look over the past week. Okay, so think about where you, are, where you were mentally, where you were spiritually, your state of mind. Were you a little bit, were you living in fear? Were you just allowing the uncertainties of life to, to steal your peace and rob you of your joy? If you're, if you're living and, you're, and your heart is troubled, you remember Jesus told his disciples, don't let your heart be troubled. The hardest thing that they were ever going to go through to see him crucified, to see him taken, and the violence that was wreaked upon him. You know, I've always said that there's never been a movie made that, that depicted the violence of the crucifixion, but, but the, the Passion of the Christ gets pretty close. And when you see, when you see that movie, and because most of us are more visual, and it, we can get it more than just a, a, just a, a, a you know, verbal description or whatever. And, and when you see the horrific things, and those disciples saw that, Jesus was trying to prepare them, don't let your heart be troubled. Hey, guys, I got good news for you. It's going to get worse before it gets better. But don't let your heart be troubled. Do you believe in God? Jesus said, believe also in me, for in my Father's house are many mansions. So whether you're sick or whether you're well, you're on the winning side because Jesus lives inside your heart. Whether you live or whether you die, you have abundant life now, but you're going to have eternal life when you step on the other side. So whatever happens in your life, you're going to be a winner. You, you cannot lose for winning because God is at work in your life. He is your good shepherd, and you're not going to lack of any good thing. Jesus refers to himself in John chapter 10 as the good shepherd. He is, a, he is the good shepherd. I am so thankful this morning for the goodness of God. If you look at John chapter 10, verse number 11, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. So the good shepherd, he protects us. I'm thankful for his protection. Some of you know of times in your life that God protected you, but probably the majority of the times he protected you, you didn't even know. He delayed your vehicle and kept you from being in a terrible accident. Some of you ladies may have been walking at a store at the mall, and he, he delayed you to protect you from having an encounter with somebody that could have, could have inflicted violence upon you, upon you. You just never know how many times God has stepped up some of you, I know that the way you drive, you have kept the angels of the Lord very busy because the angels of the Lord are kept around about you. And some of you have a guardian angel. Some of you have a whole team of angels that are trying to keep you safe because God's not finished with you yet. I, remember, I can barely remember going to school, but I remember in third grade, we had a kid in our class that he was, this kid was big. I mean, he was much bigger than... Uh, and, and I was in third grade. This kid was in fifth grade, and he was big for a fifth grader. And he got into a fight. He got into a fight with uh, one of my friends. But my friend, he was pretty stout, pretty stout guy. Uh, I never lost a fight. I've never lost a fight in my life because people cannot catch me. I am fast. I'm like the wind, baby. Whew. I just don't want nobody messing up this beautiful face. You know? <laughs> So fighting just never made much sense to me. But anyway, this fifth grader was picking on my friend who was in third grade. We were all, third graders were all hanging, hanging around, and they were kind of wrestling on the ground. The fifth grader couldn't gain an advantage, and we were all kind of laughing at him. So he jumped up, and he started, I was, I was the runt of the litter, so he thought, I'm going to go after him. 
So he started coming after me, and I'm thinking, you know, what in the world do I do? Well, I was getting ready to put it in gear. Because this kid, he, all he had seen, like the roadrunner, just dust, dirt, a cloud of dirt. That's all he would have seen. And all of a sudden, this kid stepped in between. This kid, who was about twice my size, stepped in between us. It turned out to be my bigger brother, who was also in the fifth grade and knew this kid, who wasn't very bright, so he just, you know, his claim to fame, he just bullied all the third graders. And my big brother stepped in between us, and this kid was looking at me, and next thing you know, he was looking in the face of a water buffalo. I mean, there was my brother. My brother was a big dude. And th that kid, he took a step back. My brother said, you lay a hand on him, I will literally kill you. <laughs> uh, okay, pray for my brother. But anyway, <laughs> but I was thankful. I would know I was thankful he was willing to kill this guy at that point because it was, he was going to. He was going to save my life. I've often thought about how many times, uh, of course, now I have to admit, I, once my big brother stepped in, I started getting a little cocky. I said, you better be glad my brother was here, fool. You better be. I got, real, I got real cocky. But I wonder how many times, how many times the enemies tried to step in against us, and we have a big brother who steps in between. <laughs> Amen. God is our father. Jesus is our elder brother, and he steps in between us. And he, I'll tell you something. He is the king of all kings and the Lord of all lords. You talk about the master of the universe. He is it. And so I'm thankful that I'm thankful that he is on our side. He is the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. Isaiah 54, 17. I love this verse. First part of it says, no weapon that is fashioned against you shall succeed. Because right now, every single one of you, because Jesus lives in your heart, the enemy has come against you. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. There is demonic forces in this world that are constantly scheming against you, and they're making plans to destroy you and making plans to afflict you and destroy your family and to hurt your relationship, your marriage relationship, to destroy your children, destroy you physically. But I'm thankful in the name of Jesus, no weapon formed against you. How many of you will receive this this morning? No weapon formed against you and your family is going to prosper if you will stay in Christ. If you will stay in Christ. I read this, I read this, uh, this illustration many years ago. I never forgot it. During a Chinese-Japanese war, the Chinese, uh, I think the Chinese had the tanks and everything. And uh, the Japanese realized because they, they did not have the weaponry to try and fight. So what they would do is they would have a sniper up there and he would shoot at the tank. And eventually, and the guys inside the tank would get frustrated because they couldn't figure out where the sniper was. So one of them would stick out his head to try to locate the sniper, and he had him. That's what he did. As soon as he stuck his head out, he took him out. I'm going to tell you something. You're in a protection today. You have the whole armor of God. You are in Christ. You are in the name of Jesus. And as long as you stay in Christ and you don't get into an area of compromise, you don't get to an area of disobedience to God, as long as you stay in Christ, you are sheltered in his arms today. You have a shepherd that has laid down his life for you that will protect you. And I'm thankful for his protection. He guides us. Verse uh, 4 of John chapter 10 says this, when he when he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Verse 14 of that same chapter says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. We know his voice. We hear his voice. There's so many voices that's in the world today. There's a term that we're, we're hearing more and more, and, and it's all over social media and in, and in the old school media People that at one time had been very prominent worship leaders or people in the ministry or Christian authors, the term that they're using is, I am deconstructing my faith, which is a very fancy way of saying, I've made the de decision that I want to backslide. That's really basically what it means. Because when you deconstruct your faith, now you're beginning to call into question the validity of God's word. Well, I mean, you know, it, it's almost like the same lie that... that that Satan said in the garden, did God really say, he told Eve, did God really say to cause you to question the word of God? And so to deconstruct your faith, then it's not, you're not hearing the voice of God anymore. Now you're listening to the voices of the world and the spirit of this world, and it's causing you to slip into compromise. Now I know all of us have probably be, have been injured in friendly fire. And what do I mean by that? Sometimes attending church can be hazardous to your faith. You know why? Because there are times that people are hypocritical. 
There are times that Christians, some of the meanest people you'll ever meet are people that sit on church pews. Can I get amen? Not anybody in this church. Not anybody here. We walk in love, but there are some churches that, that, really, that really struggle with that. I hate it when I see people that are hypocritical. I hate it when I see that hypocrisy more in my own life. There are times that I'm, I'm inconsistent with what I should be. I don't want to be. I'm not trying to fool anybody. I'm not trying to deceive anybody. But guys, you just got to relax. He's not finished with me yet. <laughs> I'm still, some of you are a lot closer than I am, and I'm still, I'm still a work in progress. And he's not finished with me. Yeah, there was a young man in the New Testament that deconstructed his faith. Paul wrote about him in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10. He said, For Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me, and gone to Thessalonica. So you see these worship leaders, you see some of these pastors, you see some of these Christian authors that made a lot of money off the church. They're now, they're now saying, no, I'm deconstructing the faith. I don't believe the word of God anymore. They're just like Demas. They've loved this present world. Why don't you just say, hey, I just don't want to be a Christian anymore. You don't have to attack everybody that's still a believer. But that's just part of the spiritual deception that's going on in the world today. And that's what happens when you listen to the wrong voices. Jesus said, my sheep, they know my voice. And it's, it can be difficult because there can be reasonings and logic and things that can be presented in your life that can deceive you. Satan appears as an angel of light and he tries to impersonate the voice of God and he can lead you astray. That's the reason why, guys, if you want an amazing Christian life, you should write this down. If you have any paper, write it on your neighbor's arm. Write this. If you want to live an amazing Christian life, read God's word. Do what it says. That's it. That's how simple it is. But when we get out of God's word and we start getting into the philosophies and we start listening to people that are starting to doubt and question and they're deconstructing their faith. I don't want to deconstruct my faith. I want to build my faith. I want my faith in him to be stronger. I know in the last days Paul said that there's going to be a falling away. There's going to be a falling away. But yet Peter on the day of Pentecost said, in the last days I will pour out of my spirit. So, so that middle ground is being eliminated. That gray air is being eliminated. You're going to have to make up your mind. Am I going to be a part of the church that's falling away? Or am I going to be a part of the church that's being filled with the Holy Spirit and being used by God to take this gospel throughout the world? So I want to be a part of that outfill, uh, infilling of the Holy Spirit, that outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the last days. Amen. 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 So he guides us because we hear his voice. He provides for us, John chapter 10, verse 10. I quote this verse all the time, so you guys know this is one of my favorite verses. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. He provides for us every area of your life. If it's important to you, it's important to him. And if he doesn't give you want what you want, it's because he needs to give you what you need. I've shared this before, but how many times I've encountered somebody says, yeah, being a Christian sounds really good, but it's just too much I have to give up. But whatever he requires, he's got some. whatever he requires for you to eliminate from your life, he's got something better. Amen. He's got something so much better. And he's come to give us abundant life. Jesus said it this way in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6, 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and, and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Why? Because he's our shepherd. He's the good shepherd. He, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. So when I seek first the kingdom of God, and not just the kingdom of God, but his righteousness, have, having a commitment to live in integrity, having a, a commitment to be righteous, having a commitment to doing things the right way, even though it's, there are times that we're, in life we're presented shortcuts all the time. But I can't tell you how many times I've took a shortcut. It didn't work out too well for me. I remember years ago we were up at Garner State Park, and you know, Years and years ago, they used to have an entrance to Garner, but there was a big, massive flood, wiped it out. So they had to, instead of fixing it, the, there was a, they, they created another entrance to Garner. And, and I remember we used to be able to hike up the old entrance. You couldn't drive it anymore. It was too dangerous, but it was, you know, it was okay to walk. So we got up there, and, and our camp was actually down the side of the hill, and it was a pretty, pretty big hill. It's a hill country, obviously. So... Uh, some of them said, well, we're just going to walk all the way around. And a few of them said, hey, you know, let's just take this. Let's take this shortcut. Let's just go down. It's a little steep, but we're young. We can do it. So I was young, all right. So I took, and I'm about halfway down, feeling like, you know, an explorer or something. I've, I've got this under control. And then my foot slipped. And I started rolling down that hill. And God put something there to stop me, to keep me from losing my life, rolling all the way down. You know what it was called? It's called a cactus. 
And on my back pockets, it's the best way I can say it in church. I might use different word if I'm not in church, but in the church, I'm going to say my back pockets was full of those little And I just remember, I remember they had to help me down the rest of that hill. And for the next 20 minutes, they were pulling those little sticker things out of my back, my back pockets. And I was crying like a little girl. Oh, my goodness, that hurt. Sometimes the shortcuts in life, they seem like, oh, this is the way. I know God's word says this, but I'm going to do this. You know, listen, guys, God's word describes what marriage is supposed to be. God's Word describes what sexuality is supposed to be. God's Word describes what integrity is supposed to be. God's Word describes for us. And as long as we stay in the safety of God's Word, you're not going to sit on a cactus. You do not want to say, you take the shortcuts of life, and you're constantly finding yourself doing damage repair and and trying to fix yourself and try to pray for forgiveness and pray for God to restore you. But But even if it's the long way, and even if you can't see the answer at the end of the road, Trust Him, trust the process, trust Him, believe in His Word, obey His Word, and I promise you the Good Shepherd is going to take care of you and provide everything that you need. John chapter 12, verse 10 says this, He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. I like that because He takes care of us because Jesus said, I'm the shepherd and you're the sheep. And you belong to me. I think everyone is looking and longing to be accepted. I, okay, you know, I'm older than dirt, but I remember I have such a heart for teenagers. I remember how difficult it was to be a teenager. I have such a heart. And I think as hard as being a teenager was, when I turned 18, it seemed like it got more difficult. Life got more complex. And you're trying to work your way, you're trying to work your way through that. So I just want to say, man, when you're, around, when you're around teenagers and you're around young adults, can you just show them a lot of grace? And, you know, some of, some of us, we forget how difficult it was. They have fashions. I have to admit, sometimes I laugh at the hairstyles. But if I had hair, maybe I would wear that same thing. Every time I see a man bun, I just feel like I just slap him a little bit, you know. <laughs> I say, don't do that. <laughs> but, but you know what? They have different styles. And, and we forget that when we were young, we did things to aggravate our parents. We had hairstyles that aggravated our parents. We listened to different kinds of music than our parents did. Guys, let me tell you something. God sends teenagers in your life to pay you back for how you tormented your parents. Can I get amen? I, and, and I'm just going to say this. I had literally no trouble with my kids, so I must have been a perfect <laughs> child growing up. I wasn't perfect, but I guarantee compared to my two older brothers, I was, I was perfect because those guys need Jesus really bad. But teenagers are, are really, they, they look for a sense of belonging. They look, they look to be accepted. And I think all of us are looking for that. My identity today is not in how much money I have or don't have. My identity is not even in my last name. My identity is not what other people think about me or how popular I may be, although I'm so incredibly popular, it makes me sick to think about it. My identity is in none of those things. My identity is based on the fact that I'm a child of God. I'm a child of His. And I I have a good shepherd that not only protects me and he guides me and he provides for me but he he delivers us I, i'm thankful that even when we do get get ourselves into a jam i've had people say well you know you shouldn't just go to god every time you have a need no no i think you really should i really think you should and i'm getting to the stage of my life i'm getting better about this that whenever i'm faced when I'm, I'm confronted or faced with a situation i turn to him first thank god for brothers and sisters in christ and we, we are supposed to help each other. Somebody said that the Christian army is the only army that kills its own wounded. Let's not be that army. Let's be the army that runs and we minister to each other and we love each other. And you know what? There's not a Bible verse that says, I told you so. So please refrain from walking up to somebody that you've been giving them advice and they don't take your advice and, and it was good advice, but things fall apart. You don't need to say, hey, I told you so. 
Why don't you say, hey, you know what? Let me pray for you. Is there anything else I can do? Let's just, you know what? Because you may be down this week, but it may be me next week. So I want grace all over this place. Now, grace is not covering up things. It's not like covering up sins or whatever. It's not like that. You know, they're the Holy Spirit, but you have to realize that it's the Holy Spirit's job to convict. It's not your job to convict. It's not my job to convict. It's the Holy Spirit's job. And trust me, people that have things going on in their life that, and, and, and you're not aware of it, the Holy Spirit's all over them, dealing with them. So when he does bring them to the repentance or he does bring them to the place where they're trying to correct that, Let's surround them with love and grace and support. Well, what if they've done it before and they've done it again? Well, guess what? That's just part of the human battle, the, human, the, the journey that we're on. But I'm thankful for his deliverance, that he does deliver us. And, and he provides healing in our lives. I'm thankful that he is a healer. John chapter 1, verse 17 says this, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So I'm thankful this morning that our good shepherd not only gives us grace, he gives us grace, which is, his blessing and His goodness in our life, even though we don't deserve it. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I don't care how godly you are. I don't care how spiritual you are. I don't care how long you've sat in the church. You still don't deserve His grace any more than the guy out on the street. Because this is by grace. We don't deserve it. Guys, none of us deserve it. And yes, I, through obedience, we, we put ourselves in position to be blessed by God more than somebody who's walk, walking in, in disobedience. But that shepherd, that good shepherd, he came to bring grace and truth. So he blesses us even though we don't deserve it, but yet he also speaks truth into our lives. Truth is, in a, truth is, is one of those things where, uh, I, this, this, to me, I th this is one of the most hilarious and yet sad statements I ever hear people say, well, I'm walking in my own truth. What does that mean? I'm just walking in my own truth. What does that mean? Okay? I'm going to go punch you right in the face. I'm just walking in my own truth, baby. You know, what, I mean, you know, there's just, it's like there's no right and there's no wrong. You can't call out anything anymore because we've got to be politically correct and everything, everything's to be accepted. I'm thankful. Look, you have a choice of whether you're going to be a follower of Jesus or not. But once you choose to be a follower and to stay in relationship with him, you have to be obedient. That's it. And these people that are trying to write their own ticket and they're cherry-picking certain Bible verses that they like and the ones they don't like, they just kind of blow it off. I'll tell you something. He stands for truth and he'll stand for truth in your life. And understand that it's the truth, not lies and not compromise and deception, but it's the truth that will set you free. John chapter 10, verse 16 says this, and I say this in closing. Can I get a real amen here now? Amen. Woo, even the Baptist said amen on that. John chapter 10, verse 16, And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. I'm thankful that when John was on the Isle of Patmos and he sees a glimpse of heaven, and he saw people from every kindred, from every tongue, from every tribe, from every nation, worshiping around the throne of God. And you know what I love? I absolutely love the fact that you have denominations that will say, well, this person, because of their gender or whatever, they can't be in the ministry. And I'm thankful that God delights in taking people that we say he can't use, and he's using them, he's using them to change the world. Because it doesn't matter what we look like on the, uh, on the outside. It doesn't matter how much money we have or how much, even how much education we have. All those, all those things, I guess, are important to a certain extent. But what matters is that, that he places a call upon our life. And he has sheep sometimes that we don't know anything about. One of the things that I think that we're seeing and we're, we're getting better about in the body of Christ is that we're just choosing, we're just choosing to walk in love. I'm very, very concerned about church, church congregations that are picking sides in, in, in the political discussion. And, and look, I feel like that if I make a political comment and you're a Republican, and if I offend you, or if you're a Democrat, see, if I offend everybody, I feel like I've done my job. Can I get amen? I just want to, I'll make some anti-Trump statements, and just some, uh, some of the Republicans get upset, and then I'll pick on Biden, who doesn't even know where he's at most of the time, and then the Democrats get upset. So I just want to pick on everybody. But you know, if this is not about politics. Politics is not the greatest power and strength in the world. 
It's the church of the Lord Jesus Christ and the gospel of Jesus Christ that changes people's lives. And when people's lives are changed, then all the laws that, we, that are intended to do good that sometimes don't really play out with the best of consequences, when people's lives are changed and all those laws aren't, you don't even need to pass them because we love God and we love each other. Amen? Amen. Amen. He's a good shepherd. I want to encourage you to be good sheep. <laughs> Amen. Be obedient to him. Father, we thank you today for your love and for your grace. Thank you, Lord, that you are our shepherd. And we're living in such troubled times, and yet you're the one constant that is there. And you are God. You said, I am the Lord, and I change not. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so, Father, today our eyes are upon you. And Lord, with so many things that are happening, with, with illness that's all around us, and and, and with war and rumors of wars, it's almost, like, it's almost like we're living Matthew chapter 24. When all these things, Jesus said, when all these things begin to happen, this is just, but don't be alarmed. Don't be upset. Don't be fearful. Don't be troubled. This is just the beginning of sorrow. So, Lord, we, we know where we're at. We know what's going to happen in this world, not because of Fox or CNN or MSNBC, but we know because your word tells us how things are going to be when you return. And I pray, Lord, that we'll be prepared and ready. You said, be ready, because I'm coming in an hour when you least expect me. And so, Father, I pray, God, that our hearts will be turned to you. Through this, continue to reset our priorities, that we'll put Jesus first, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And, Lord, I pray that as, as we all go out in the, uh, the world that we live in, the people that we encounter, our jobs, our schools, all those different places, the grocery store, uh, Whatever clubs that we may be involved in or whatever, I pray, God, that our lives would be light and salt and that people will see us and they'll see Jesus in us. I ask, Father, all these things. Lord, for those in our church family that are sick, we have a number that are ill. We just ask, God, that you would continue, that you would continue to see them, con continue to see them through uh, this, this illness. And, Father, we just pray for those that have other needs in their lives in our church family. We know, God, that you're still on the throne. You are our good shepherd. You are our shepherd. The Lord is our shepherd. We are not going to want or lack of anything that we need. Father, we just commit all these situations into your hands, knowing, God, that you're in control and you're still on the throne. In Jesus' name we pray. Everyone said amen. amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.